to Welcome to Latinos in Clinical Research. This is Monica Quitiba. We have today a special guest, Dr. Al Jesar Lee, and he's going to be speaking about the uh, uh, COVID uh, and uh, about the practice during, uh, I mean, practicing during COVID uh, period or times. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we have uh, here with us Ashley Margo. Dan Sfrea and Chris Sauber. So I hand it to you, uh, um, Ashley. Awesome, thanks Monica. Well, thank you so much for being here, everybody that is viewing in right now. Um, so we really wanna focus in on, you know, as a physician during COVID-19, what were the effects, right, during the situation and, you know, how things were addressed throughout and how we went about uh, making things back to some sort of normalcy, right? So. Uh, Dr. al um, I wanted to see, you know, for you, how, how did you uh, manage when all this started with COVID-19? How did your site handle, you know, hearing about this and addressing everything with the subjects that you were having? Uh, well, it's been almost a year now since we started with the COVID. And yeah. it's been a really tough year for research for my patients. I'm an oncologist, so usually my patient... Uh, most of them have to come to my office to be seen and like this. And unfortunately, this is some patient, they don't want to come because of they're afraid of the COVID. But uh, eventually they will come because they need to be treated with the treatment that we provide only in the uh, professional area with the professional staff. Uh, it is difficult uh, to, from the beginning, how to start and like this, but I think there is a lot of guideline that came out regarding handling the situation, which is like wearing the PPE and the social distancing, which been, uh, we, we've been doing this, we've been doing some uh, monitoring virtually uh, by uh, seeing the patient us and then updating the records and everything and uploading it to the cloud. So we've been doing like site initi initiation virtually and and and, and also uh, conducting uh, some patient uh, interviews and uh, follow up on the patient also virtually. So the virtual space is coming up as the main uh, thing now for the the new thing now everybody's going yeah. virtual yeah i i saw this more mainly more in the last couple of months of 2020 and this year the most of the cro's or the drug companies are are having no problem by conducting the whole site initiation and the agreement and interviewing the physician and the site staff all of them uh Virtually. Well, you know, and then I'm glad that you brought that up because, you know, obviously for a major CRO, right, you have the resources, they have the money to be able to transition on the fly with technology and all of that. So not being from corporate, not being from a major university, you know, how was that difficult for you to transition into virtual right away and, you know, training your site, uh, your site staff and being able to get the patient subjects on board and all that? I'm part of the big uh, chain of a clinic here in Los Angeles, oh. and we adapted the system directly for all the clinics, and my clinic's one of them. So it was uh, no problem by initiating the Zoom virtual and also doing the video conferencing with the patient and with the drug company and CROs. Awesome, awesome. And how would you say, you know, uh, as far as now, after being a year in, would you say that it's more comfortable now doing virtual or would you very much prefer going back to the one-on-one -on -one with uh... i think it's much better and much easier to to do with uh virtual i awesome. think uh, going back one-on-one -on -one will be kind of strange but i think it's, it's the new trend because now we don't know when this COVID is going to finish. And every six months or three months, we're having a new strain that's coming up more serious, more yeah. thing. So I think everybody will uh, all the industries in medicine is going mainly uh, virtual. virtual. And now new technology coming out that you can ship to the house for the patient to check their temperature. And then they will 
they will uh, upload it to the patient chart and also blood pressure and everything. Everything going to be virtual where you can monitor the patient virtually as a patient in my clinic or as a patient in clinical trial. Awesome. And I would assume that that would make it now more easier for the subject, right? The patient, because they don't have to leave their home. They have, it's more accommodating, right? You have everything at hand's length there at home. Uh, would you see that you have more activity from the subject now, from the patient within the study, or would you find it that it's a little bit more difficult? Uh, for oncology, a little bit difficult because you need not to monitor the blood pressure only and the uh, temperature, you need to check on the patient's symptoms and side effects from the treatment itself. And that's why I have to ask some patients sometimes to come uh, to do clinical visit to be assessed mainly before any treatment. We can accept that like in between the treatment, if there is any side effect or anything, we can monitor it uh, virtually, but most of the cases uh, be, uh, prior to any treatment to assess the patient uh, completely, I I asked the patient to come in, especially. Okay. So maybe the future is blending. The future is blending the the virtual part with the uh, visit part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounds it sounds like that would probably be much more better. Hybrid. Yeah, hybrid. There you go. Hybrid's a good hybrid. word. <laughs> hybrid sure. patient uh, patient visits. You know, and I I'll, think it's actually very convenient to. If, for example, the patients are in a different areas, like or or if they live farther from the clinic, and it will allow the industry to probably target patients that otherwise we couldn't in the in the, in the I mean before because they were far. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So if sense. they have to come like once in a while, then it makes it makes sense to have them in in the in the study in the studies. Yeah, Let's... Uh, Monica, I understand this like usually for a patient who's in internal medicine or other sub subspecialty, but for oncology, I'm, I'm finding it very hard to start chemotherapy and not to see the patient or not to evaluate the patient prior to the treatment. Mm -hmm. I can monitor his uh, blood work and his uh, chemistry work through the virtual uh, sites or through the lab work, but just to make sure that I'm not doing any harm for the patient, because if yeah. something happened to the patient, the side effect gonna be devastating and the patient maybe have to be admitted to the hospital yeah. to, uh, to be treated and managed by the side effect. And let's not give people the wrong impression. Clinical Re 2021 is busy. We just gave, we just sent you Dr. Al earlier today, two studies, two brand yeah. new studies yeah. for oncology. And uh, I mean, guess who might be your monitors? <laughs> uh, That's nice. It, it ain't going to be virtual, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I might have another one for you. No, with you, it's it not going to be virtual. <laughs> We're old fashioned Flintstones. We're the Flintstones, <laughs> not the Jetsons. Uh, but it brings up a good point, you know, with the stuff Ashley was talking about. And this is for Latinos in clinical research. Yeah. So we want to throw in the disparities. Like why, and I know you have a new project, which by the way, um, you're definitely involved with us in Latinos and clinical research. You have a new clinic you opened in a underserved community in LA, like 99% Hispanic, right? Yes. Why are we not getting more Hispanics, Latinos in clinical trials, specifically COVID, if we're talking about COVID, but yes. feel free to talk about oncology as well. I think they both apply the same probably the same cause. Why? Give us your opinion because we love having physician PIs opinions on this show. I, I, my, my main intake on this is in the minority population, Latino, African-American, uh, uh, Middle Eastern, any, any, any type of, uh, uh, the approach to them have to be individual because all these come from cultural stuff. Uh, if you approach somebody Spanish and think that you're gonna do for him, if you do not sit and explain for him what's going on and everything, it is just treating him as a guinea pig. Mm -hmm. The same thing for the 
other uh, minorities, okay, because they are already coming from different background than the people here in the United States. That's the main approach, and that's why I heard it. I I approach many patient minority, and that's why they're telling we don't want to be a guinea pig. Yeah. So definitely, you know, the the need for like resources and teaching and like deeper understanding to provide to the patients and the subject so that they know what, you know, they're getting involved in and that they're also being considered through the process. It's not just, you know, okay, well, we need you, please, you know, come in. You're actually addressing an issue with them and, and making sure that they feel comfortable, right? What, that's what I said is like patient part. The other part is the physician part. Mm -hmm. Physicians are too busy and they do not have, you see rarely a, lot, a, physi a Spanish physician in the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they work and they're very busy. They're very, uh, have a lot of patients to see and they do not have time to spend with the patient to discuss about the clinical trial per se. Okay, yeah. clinical trial, you need to bring the patient, sit with him, explain for him the protocol, the consent and everything as a physician, as a PI. Okay, and then you start the consent process and consenting the patient. If you don't spend time enough to make them understand what's going on, you know, I don't think the patient will sign up, especially for minorities. Mm -hmm. That makes up a very good point. So, and again, you know, with the resources, right? Making sure that you have your staff that can be able to facilitate you as best as possible, uh, be able to step in to make the process a little bit shorter for the PI so that, you know, it can assist with, um, consenting the subject and making sure that, again, you know, we're addressing them um, within their language, right, and making sure that it's being done thoroughly, but also giving time for the PI and, and making sure that all bases are being covered. So, I mean, that's personally why I like Latinos in clinical research. I feel like what we're bringing to this sphere in, in clinical research is shedding a light on this aspect because I don't think a lot of sponsors of CROs understand that this is a big issue, right? And um, getting physicians like you coming on here and speaking about it, it's really good and it's important. I don't know if Monica, you had some exposure or understanding about you know some of your sites that have the same issue. Yeah. Sorry. It, uh, it, Monica, sorry. <laughs> yes. No, 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 go ahead, doctor. Finish. No, 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 no. go ahead. Monica. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll follow up on that. So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, uh, there is a huge need, uh, especially because the sponsors don't understand quite well the need of all this. And then and then also because, uh, I, I mean, we hear everybody that wants to bring minorities and wants to bring diversity to clinical trials, but at the end of the day, everything just, it's just like words. We don't see actually anybody uh, um, doing really something that helps, especially the sites, because the sites are the ones that at the end of the day are bringing these patients in. And, and sometimes we have the patients and we have them ready to go in the study. We know they qualify, they, they meet all the criteria, but then we don't have any materials to work with them. Like we don't have the ICF translated on time. We don't have uh, like uh, flyers or marketing material for, to inform these patients about it. So there is a huge need uh, for the sponsors to understand, to truly understand the need of this. Yeah. It, I know the sponsors understand that they need to bring minorities, that they bring to, uh, they need to bring diversity, but they don't know how. <laughs> and yeah. oh, they don't understand how. So that's what we really need. And it's like the discussion we were having earlier, right? It's like, oh, you know, we want recruitment. We want to recruit, you know, diverse subjects. It's like, okay, yes. But if you're not providing what the site needs internally to process them through, if you're not putting like light, shedding light on that and addressing that, right, which is a major important part, then the recruitment is going to not do much for you, right? So you have to support the site, a diverse site, and so that they can then turn around and be able to bring in recruitment and be able to thoroughly, you know, explain to the subjects of the patients what's going on and, and then ultimately, you know, bring them in through the study, right? So I, sometimes, you know, when I hear these conversations, you know, talking about what, you know, what they're trying to do, diversity, diversity, I'm like, yes, but I think they're also looking at it from the wrong end, you know, and I, this is partially why I love Latinos and Clinical Research, our group, uh, uh, clinical circle, because we have site owners, we have CRCs, we have RSM, CRAs, and we have a physician. We're all coming from 
from different perspectives and we're definitely honing in on this right and it's super important that we do that so if you know this is your first time watching this webinar make sure you sign up on Latinos in Clinical Research on our LinkedIn, on our website, and look for uh, the Clinical Circle on YouTube because there's going to be a lot of information on this. But yeah, and, and, and tell your peers right. to sign in too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Subscribe, hit the bell button so you don't miss out on notifications. No matter what platform you're on, YouTube, uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell button, LinkedIn. This is going to go on all those things. We're going to do a series of COVID talks. This is just one of yes. many. Ashley's got everything planned out, guys. All right. So <laughs> and we're bringing also Spanish. Yeah. Spanish, <laughs> yes. oh, and Spanish videos Spanish. and Spanglish videos. Exactly. We're going to do Spanglish. We're going to do English. We'll do any, honestly, however we can communicate, guys, we'll do it. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Al, very much for giving us some much needed insight into the physician's perspective. We'll do more. I'm done. We're very proud to have you as a member of the Clinical Research Circle and Latinos in Clinical Research. And we look forward to doing some vlogs when you get your new site up and running. I'm gonna come down there with my camera and we're gonna do vlog of the whole thing. We're gonna paint the town Latinos in Clinical Research color. Ooh. And we're going to uh, film it all, put it all on the socials, guys. This is the beginning of a movement. Go to latinosinclinicalresearch.com, put your email in there so you're on the email list so you don't miss out on the Zoom calls. We're actually helping people get jobs already. We haven't yeah. started. We're only two months. I know. Two months yeah. making changes yep. already. And this is what it's going to cost you this much. Zero. Zero dollar. But it does cost you your most important asset, which is your time. Time. Sorry about that part. We can't <laughs> have figured out that yet. But zero dollar. So thank you guys very much, Ashley, Monica, Dr. Al. And thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Make sure thank you. Thank you. Thank you.